Week 8 Ecology, Environments and Ecosystems. It is evening on a large open grassy plain. Cattle rumble across the land, moving, moving toward their evening sleeping spot. Their movement stirs up clouds of dust. Several feet behind the herd, you spot dozens of small walking birds. Are they chickens? Why are they in the cattle field walking in the dust cloud? Well, if you can get close enough, typo there, sorry about that, you can cross off the P close enough, you will find the answer. The birds are cattle egrets, not chickens, and they are enjoying a feast of insects, insects that have been kicked up by the herd of cattle. The grasses, the insects, the cows, and the cattle egrets are all interacting or working together. The grasses provide food for the cattle and shelter for the insects. At the same time, the insects help to pollinate the grasses. As the cattle move through the grasses, the insects fly out of their way and the birds follow behind the cattle, snapping up the flying insects. These living things interact with each other in the grassland environment. This is just one example of how organisms interact and the grassland is only one type of ecosystem. An ecosystem consists of all, all the living and non-living non things in a certain area that interact with each other. And just as in this grassland example, all the living and non-living factors in any ecosystem are interconnected. What do we mean by living and non-living factors? Well, we know that living factors include plants and animals, as well as other organisms like viruses, bacteria, and fungi. But did you know non-living resources are just as important to an ecosystem? Just imagine trying to live without non-living resources like water, soil, sunlight, warmth, or air. Obviously, non-living factors are required for all life. <clears throat> a change in any non-living factor can have an effect on the other factors living and non-living in the environment. All the living and non-living things in an environment are interconnected. In this issue, we'll look at the different types of interactions that can occur between living and non-living factors in an ecosystem. We'll also look at different types of populations that live in various ecosystems, like the grass, insects, cow, cow and cattle egrets, Oh, cows and cattle egrets. Sorry, I got confused about the comma there. The factors in every ecosystem are interconnected. Together, they form a fascinating web of life. Biomes. Biomes are often referred to as ecosystems, and that's one way to think of them. A better description labels biomes as complex communities of plants and animals that share a climate. Biomes that are mainly on land are called terrestrial. So like when people talk about a rough terrain, it's like rocky ground. So terrestrial is talking about land. Biomes in water are called aquatic. Depending on the world region in which they are found, terrestrial biomes can be categorized as grasslands, deserts, tropical rainforests, temperate rainforests, temperate deciduous forests, and tundra. Aquatic biomes are either saltwater, ocean, or freshwater, lakes and rivers. For more information about each of them, specifically, ask your teacher for a copy. I have those online. If you really want them, I will track them down for you. Now take a look at two different terrestrial biome charts here. One is a line graph and the other is 3D. Both use the same variables for the horizontal and vertical axes, temperature and precipita precipitation. Oh my word, precipitation. Whew. Both are tools that we can use to help understand the biomes on our planet. Your teacher will provide you with a, nope, we're not gonna do that. Okay, so you can check those out. It's interesting to see um, some kids prefer like seeing the 3D looking plants and some kids prefer the 2D flat stuff, so. Anyway, ecology, the study of living and non-living things. The most important thing to remember about ecosystems is that everything in, is in one is part of a complex connected web. As you already know, a system is a group of things interacting or working together. Still important to highlight. Ecology is the study of the relationships and interactions between living and non-living things in an environment. So when you see the word ecosystem, no, so you can see where the word ecosystem comes from from, it's a group of things, living and non-living, that interact together in an environment. There's your definition. Scientists who study ecosystems and environments are called, are called ecologists. Ecologists separate the world into ecosystems so they can study them, but it's important to remember that all ecosystems are connected and there's no beginning or end to any. An ecosystem can be tiny, like a drop of ocean water, or huge, like the entire ocean, or even the entire earth. It all depends on what an ecologist wants to study. Some ecologists specialize in ocean ecosystems, others study freshwater river ecosystems, and others might study forest ecosystems. Ecosystems have two types of factors, living and non-living. This is gonna be important here. Another name for living factors in an ecosystem is biotic. The word bio is the Latin prefix that means life. Non-living factors are called 
abiotic. The word with the prefix a in front means not. So like you have normal and then abnormal means not normal. So that's kind of one variation of like biotic versus abiotic. There are five general abiotic factors, water, air, soil, including rocks and landforms, temperature and light. No matter where an ecosystem is located, even if it's deep under the ocean, these abiotic or non-living factors interact to form the backdrop for living things there. A community consists of all of the biotic or living organisms in an ecosystem. So a community is living things. In a desert, a community would include cacti, mice, hawks, scorpions, sagebrush, snakes, and lizards. The community of a wetland would include far different plants and animals than those in the desert. Ecologists have similar categories within each community. These are called the, they call all of the members of a given species in a community a population. For example, all of the buttercups in the grassland are a population. All of the honeybees in the grassland are another population in the same community. Many plants and animals have similar needs for temperature, water, and sunlight, so they share a habitat. A habitat is the area where an organism lives that provides all the food, shelter, and resources the organism needs to survive. Animal, animals move around in their habitat. While plants are rooted to one spot, different organisms have different sized habitats. For example, a zebra lives on a grassy plain ranging over a large area of land as it seeks water and food. A spider lives on the same grassy plain, but its habitat is much smaller in a web. It is woven between two leaves of a plant. That small area provides all the resources the spider needs to live. Ecosystem interactions. In a community, every organism has its own niche. I love that word, it's fun. A niche is everything about that organism, what it eats, where it lives, who feeds on it, and the resources it uses. If populations were allowed to grow and multiply without limits, they would soon strip a habitat of almost all resources and nothing would be able to live there. Some interactions between organisms like competition and, and predation work to control the size of populations. So predation is like hunting. It would be nice if all organisms had plenty of resources, but now, but that's not how it is on Earth. There are never enough resources for all of the organisms. Earth is always looking for the food. No, each is always looking for the food and other resources it needs. But remember, other organisms are looking for resources too. So organisms are always struggling with others for resources. This struggle is called competition. Besides food, can you think of some other resources that organisms compete for? If you said space, water, or sunlight, you're right. That organism that loses the struggle may have to leave an area or die. Another interaction between living things is predation, the situation in which one organism kills and eats another. Predation and competition may seem harsh, but they are necessary. Sometimes organisms help each other out with symbiosis. This is when one organism lives near, on, or even inside another, and at least one of the organisms benefits from the situation. There are three types of symbiosis. Okay, so I know you guys are highlighting that stuff and, and finding this important because you're super good about catching the terms. Common, oh, commensalism is when one organism benefits and the other is not harmed, but doesn't benefit either. The relationship with the cattle egret and the cows, as you read about, is an example of commensalism. The bird benefits from living near the cattle, but the cattle aren't affected by the birds at all. I'm kind of guessing that they like the birds because then they have less bugs around them. Mutualism is where both organisms benefit from the relationship. For example, the bacteria living in our bodies helps us process our food. At the same time, our bodies provide the bacteria a place to live. Since both organisms benefit, this is an example of mutualism. Finally, there's parasitism. This is when one organism benefits from the relationship, but the other is harmed. For example, fleas, ticks, and mosquitoes, um, and mosquitoes bite and take blood from other organisms. They harm the other organism and when they do, when they do this, and so they are called parasites. Okay, I have to have my weekly farther back so the camera can get it for you guys, and I am like struggling to see that. Sorry, okay, I'll show you the picture while I read here. Everything is someone's food. So here we have a food chain. It starts with the sun, plant, animal, possibly another animal. The food web is like everything that could possibly eat that plant is shown. Everything that might eat these other animals is shown. Um, so a food chain is a step by step by step thing from, from the sun to the final eating animal. Um, and then a food web includes way more and it's, it's a web, it's more complicated. 
Everything is somebody's food. In our world, most of us don't have to hunt for our food. When we're hungry, we usually find some food in the pantry or fridge for a meal or snack. But in the wild, living things have two never-ending jobs. Find food for energy and avoid being eaten by something else. Let's start by looking at the different ways organisms get their food, get their food energy. In an ecosystem, there's a flow of energy that keeps the living things alive. And as with virtually everything on Earth, that energy begins with the sun. Producers are organisms, almost always plants, that make their own food from sunlight. A producer makes its own food, so those are all plants. They're the source of all the food in the ecosystem. Consumers are the organisms that can't make their own food. Instead, they must eat or consume something else to get energy. Some consumers only eat plants, and they're called herbivores. Others eat plants and animals, and are called omnivores. Omnis means all in Latin. The animals that eat only other animals are called carnivores. Decomposers are very important in an ecosystem. They feed on dead matter, and as they do, they break down dead organisms into simpler substances. In this way, important nutrients like nitrogen and carbon are returned to the soil, water, and air. So you can think of decomposers as nature's recycler. So decomposers, that's a good thing to highlight too. Some examples are bacteria, flies and worms, mushrooms, molds, and mildew. Ecologists refer to the simple flow of energy in an ecosystem as a food chain. Every organism provides food for another in some way. For example, in a forest, plants produce energy and are eaten by first level consumers, such as insects and small mammals. Second level consumers, such as birds or larger mammals, eat those insects and other first level consumers. Top level consumers are often carnivores that eat animals from any level below them. The process continues even after these animals die, as decomposers break down the dead flesh into the minerals and nutrients that plants need to grow, and the cycle begins again. So like this wolf, for example, in the food chain, when it dies and goes into the year, it'll become part of the soil, which will help a plant grow at some point. Pretty cool. As you know, there are thousands of living things in an ecosystem, so there are many food chains that overlap with each other. Ecologists use diagrams called food webs to explain all these interconnected relationships. They might look complicated at first, but just remember this. All the parts are connected to all the others in some way, so a change in any factor will impact all the others. That's what makes ecology such an interesting topic to study.